Hi guys, and welcome to the session on Red Hat Quay. In this presentation, I will focus on all the aspects you might want to consider before you finally deploy and start to use Quay. Quay is a very powerful product. It provides a ton of very powerful features and it provides also a lot of choices for different things you can solve in a different way. And that's why sometimes Quay is perceived as complicated. At the end of the day, it's more flexible than complicated. But however, in order to successfully deploy Quay and use it the right way or the recommended way, there might be a couple of decisions or uh, questions you need to ask yourself and decisions you need to make in order to have a setup which is sustainable for many different years and effectively gets the best out of Quay as the product. Before we jump into those different patterns and all the questions associated with, let's start with a very high level view on the Quay architecture. So Quay is a containerized product, which means it can run on nearly any containerized infrastructure. It can run on a standalone host with a container runtime, but of course it runs better on an orchestration platform. It effectively consists of Quay as a containerized application. Optionally, you can use Claire, the vulnerability scanner, the mirroring worker for a repository mirror and the Quay builders for the Git build triggers powered by Quay as well. Typically in front of Quay and Claire, you run a load balancer because typically you run more than one pod of, of both. And then you have your clients, your customers, the UI and API commands which are connecting via the load balancer to Quay and Claire. You are sourcing content from the outside, such as container images from the Reddit container catalog, from Quay.io, operators from operatorhub.io, your own content supplier content. And of course, we also need to get this CVE metadata into your environment because Claire is using it. And one of the typical clients uh, Quay is serving content to is obviously OpenShift or Kubernetes. Um, and then we have different operators running on OpenShift supposed to help with the integration of Quay into the Kubernetes platform, such as the container security operator and the Quay bridge operator. So this is a very high level overview. We will dive a little bit deeper into all those details uh, in a few minutes. So let's start with a couple of questions our customers typically asking us or we are asking them if they are asking us what's the best way to deploy Quay and then finally run and use Quay. So one of the first question is, which infrastructure Quay is supposed to run on? Is it on-prem, is it on public cloud? And obviously this has an impact on a couple of things such what is the corresponding storage backend or database service I can use? Another important question is, should I use a distinct registry for each lifecycle environment or should I start with a shared one which is used in both development and production? And then there are a couple of other scenarios which might have an impact on the overall design, such as disconnect or ergot environments and whether the Claire or builders are supposed to use or not. Let me start with the infrastructure. So effectively, Technically, Quay runs on any physical or virtual infrastructure, both on-prem or public cloud. This doesn't matter. It's a containerized application. It runs everywhere. And it also scales from a developer laptop where Quay is running on up to a very massive registry as we are using it at Quay. So there is no difference from a code perspective um, between a very small size setup on a developer laptop compared with a massive scale setup on public cloud. We recommend if the infrastructure is public cloud, then do us a favor and use the public cloud services for the backend services, such as database um, and storage. So if you run, for example, on AWS, you can use the AWS services for load balancer, storage, the database itself, the Redis cache, and also we added here a recommendation on the virtual machines, the EC2 virtual machines, at least M3 large, probably better is the M4 X large uh, sizing there. Nearly the same applies to all other infrastructures. We just picked two of them. So the other one is Azure. And again, use the public cloud service services for database on storage if you run it on public cloud. 
there's a very detailed overview of what are the different components, infrastructure, backends, etc., which we are testing against and therefore also support as part of the product production support. And all of those items are explicitly called out in the query tested configuration matrix, which is in the Red Hat customer portal. The other question is whether you should run Quay on a standalone host versus running it on OpenShift. It runs perfectly fine on both on a standalone host. Um, we have many customers who are deploying Quay on standalone container host. It's a little bit more tricky to run Quay there as an HA setup uh, if multiple hosts are involved. So you need, you need to manually or semi-automated take care on all the things Kubernetes offers out of the box. Yeah, and it gets a little bit more complicated if you look on all the recent changes or extensions or features we added to Quay primarily in the operator space because obviously Kubernetes operators only work with Kubernetes, which means you can't use them on a standalone container host. It's important to know that if you run it on a host, this host needs to be properly subscribed from a subscription perspective. So the recommended way is to run Quay on OpenShift. There are a couple of benefits coming out and all, most of those benefits are coming out directly out of the out of the box capabilities of Kubernetes. Yeah, so Kubernetes takes care of all the important aspects of running a containerized application and you can leverage them. And OpenShift goes far beyond just being the plain uh, Kubernetes orchestration layer. That's why you have a couple of additional pieces such as the operator lifecycle management, monitoring dashboards, and all the great things OpenShift offers out of the box and you can leverage it with Quay as well. So effectively Quay runs everywhere, but it runs probably best on OpenShift. And this has something to do with all the stuff we added, especially on the operator side, as I mentioned it, the Quay operator itself ensures that you can seamlessly deploy Quay on OpenShift. And also in future versions of the operator, we will take care on the entire day two management, all the different maturity levels, which are critical for operators and why we invented operators or Chorus invented operators initially. And then we are using them everywhere, especially on the platform layer. The other operator is the container security operator, which brings Quay and Claire vulnerability information into the Kubernetes platform. And starting from there, it's exposed to the OpenShift console and therefore made visualized to developers and cluster admins from within OpenShift. And the bridge operator is a new operator we just introduced with Quay 3.3, which ensures a seamless user experience if Quay and OpenShift is used together. So as I already showed on the other slide, there are a couple of benefits if Quay runs on OpenShift and probably the most important one, it's very easy to deploy Quay on OpenShift uh, because this is of course the target platform we are developing against. This is something we are investing heavily. This is the platform we know best uh, because we own it. And there are a couple of great benefits coming out of it. You can see them on this slide shown there. I don't want to dive too much into the OpenShift specifics because we will run a dedicated recording for Quay and OpenShift where we dive a little bit deeper into the specifics of all those three operators and how, how to use Quay with OpenShift and how to run Quay op on OpenShift. Let's have a look at the database backends. So, yeah, so one of the, or effectively the most critical backend dependency for Quay is the database all metadata is stored in the database. So only the physical, the binary blobs are stored in the storage backend, but all the data which is shown in the console is stored in the database. That's why the database is really critical. So since this is the most critical thing, um, definitely we recommend to run the database in HA mode. We recommend to use Postgres simply because Postgres is required by Claire if you only run if you only run Quay without Claire, then you can also use other databases such as MySQL or MyRealDB. Yeah, so, and again, if you run it on public cloud infrastructure, we recommend you to run the Postgres service provided um, by the cloud provider. Typically, since the database is a stateful application, we would recommend to not run it on the Kubernetes cluster uh, without having a database operator. We as Red Hat do not provide an operator, and that's why we partnered with our 
um, ecosystem partner crunchy data because they have a certified postgres operator and we are testing against this operator as part of our qe testing since Quay Suite 3.3, we allow you to also push the logs into an elastic search stack instead of pushing them in the database. This doesn't make the database less critical. It just limits a little bit or reduces the requirements on scalability and performance on the database side. The next prerequisite is storage backend. And by the way, prerequisite really means that it needs to exist before you start deploying Quay. Storage, um, as I already mentioned, all metadata is stored in the database. Storage is really to store all the binary blobs. Quay HA requires, similar to the database, an HA setup for storage. G replication has a hard requirement for object storage. We do not support neither local storage, nor NFS, nor any, any other local disks which are mounted into the container for production setups. Yeah. Um, so there are a couple of choices there for on-prem storage types. We do support Ceph routers or Ceph. We do support Open, uh, OpenStack Swift, and we fully support the OpenShift container storage version 4. OpenShift Container Storage version 3 remains in tech preview because the Nuba part remains in tech preview as well. And we effectively inherit this support status of the Nuba multi-cloud object gateway. On public cloud, nearly all public cloud storage backends are supported, such as AWS S3 or Google Cloud Storage or Azure Blob Storage. It's important to call out here that only hot storage is the storage backend you are supposed to use, not the cold standby storage options. Redis cache is a third component, which is kind of stateful, um, but it's less critical compared with the database and the storage backend. It's primarily used to store all the builder logs and the Quay tutorial. So let's assume you've already watched the tutorial. Um, only the builder logs are the, the, the component, which is really eventually important in there. So you need to make decision whether it needs to be HA or not. Typically, it's not um, done in an HA fashion because the, the risk of that Redis goes down and uh, is pretty low, and then the, the associated risk is also low. Um, the next decision you need to make is whether you want to run a dedicated registry, for example, for development, and another one for prod. So, I met a bunch of customers in the past and basically they, most of them insisted of having those registries keep them separated because we want to ensure that production workloads are protected kind of. And that's why we want to ensure that the content which is produced and used in the development environment is not exposed to production at all. However, um, this is something, so if that's the goal or the requirement, you can easily achieve the same thing using organizations or repositories and the corresponding RBAC permissions. So there isn't any need to split really or to run really two distinct registries, effectively because you give up all the advantages a registry brings out of the box, such as deduplication and compression, because if the same image is used in def and prod and you run two distinct registry, registries, you really have a copy of the same binary blob in your storage backend. So effectively, you are nearly doubling the cost over time and looking at the amount of binary data which is stored in registry, this could become pretty expensive. Effectively, the same applies to, we wanna separate the content, we wanna clearly distinguish between the content which is sourced from an external source such as the Reddit container catalog or our suppliers versus the one we internally produced. Yeah, so we don't want to mix it in the same tool. And again, this is something you can easily achieve with the organizations and repositories and the RBAC permissions. Um, the same applies to the, let's say, upgrade and update experience. Yeah, so you shouldn't be really concerned that an upgrade breaks the registry and then a critical component isn't available anymore and this potentially breaks workload, workloads or even the cluster. So this is something we probably 
or we hope that we are doing a great job on testing all the features before we ship it. In case you don't know, the release and deployment model of Quay means we are developing those features. We are testing it intensively internally in our QE. Then we push it to Quedo and make it available to selected namespaces. And after this has been stabilized and we open the door and basically make it available globally in Quedo, after this has been stabilized again, then we finally build the product packages or images and ship it to our customers. So it should be stable when it arrives in your environment. So this shouldn't be the, the main reason why you want to run two distinct registries. Um, the same applies, I, I met a couple of customers and for whatever reason they wanted to run a registry within each of their data centers. Yeah, so the default use case is Quay can easily serve content to multiple data centers. Uh, HA can stretch, stretch across different data centers simply because the HA is primarily achieved on the backend side and storage typically all the time runs in more than one data center. But if you just look at the use case of Quay.io, where we are serving billions of images to thousands of clients globally dispersed across the globe. Um, this is a use case why this shouldn't apply to you as well. So this shouldn't be an issue. The other one is scalability concerns. Um, again, the same code base is used for Quaid O. So if you are running into performance issues with Red Hat Quay, um, this might mean that either something went wrong or you run a registry at the same scale as we do with Quaid.io, which is one of the five biggest registries out there. So sca the scalability of Quay shouldn't be the concern. The only, let's say, valid reason why it makes sense to have two distinct registries between dev and prod might be if you really need to have distinct registry-wide configurations. So for example, if you really want to ensure that the Quay builders are only used and enabled in the development environment, but not in production, stuff like this. So, and this also applies to if you have a different ownership and different team with different users supposed to act as the super admin for the registry and stuff like this, then it makes sense because obviously if, if it's a registry wide configuration, which differs, then you can't use one shared registry, which is used across all those lifecycle environments. But in most of the cases, it's really the recommended way is to run a shared registry instead of having distinct multiple ones you need to operate and maintain as well. Um, quick um, quick um, talk about the disconnected and airgapped environment. So while Quay runs perfectly fine in an airgapped environment, Claire does not. Claire needs to fetch the CVE or vulnerability um, metadata, and this requires that Claire is at least connected to the internet as of today. You can use proxies, so that, that's not an issue. That's not, that, that's not an issue. This still means that the cluster Quay is serving content to, they can be disconnected. Yeah, so this doesn't matter. Um, as long as Quay and Claire is connected, this is not an issue. Future versions of Quay will bring a feature, and this is a slide from the Red Hat Quay roadmap deck, effectively describing what is our future vision on an enhanced support for airgap environment, where, where we will allow to run both Quay and Claire entirely airgap, and then you, of course, all the clusters um, Quay is serving content to are running airgap as well. But as of today, Claire needs to run in a connected mode, Hopefully with the upcoming release 3.4, we will get rid of this limitation. From a network access or firewall perspective, it's fairly easy. Obviously, all your clients and all your clusters, all the nodes need to be able to access the registry itself. So this is typically the SSL port, so 443, uh, assuming that you run only encrypted communication to the registry. Uh, so port 80 is typically not needed. And then there are two optional ports for the config app and for the Prometheus endpoint, which typically is not exposed to the outside world, but maybe to a broader internal community of clients who need to have access to it. All the other services, so Postgres, Redis, and Claire, 
are not supposed to be exposed to the outside world. So those are just services which, of course, need to be accessible by Quay, but not by the client. So all the connection happens between the client and Quay as the registry. Only the storage backends needs to be accept, uh, accessible by the client if you do not enable or use the storage proxy uh, option. Which also means that if the client access to the storage backends is not feasible for whatever reason, then you can use the storage proxy to work around this. And then the Quay container is serving the binary blob to the client. One of the last class, uh, questions I had on my slide was the simple question whether you want to use Claire and the Quay build automation. Those are optional components. You don't have to. We, of course, strongly recommend to use them because we believe it's quite powerful and it does a couple of great things for you. Um, just a very brief introduction. So Claire is the uh, vulnerability scanning tool uh, which has been developed for Quay but is also used by other third party products. So you might have seen the announcement from last year where AWS ECR started to use Claire as the scanning backend as well. VMware Harbor is using it, other tools are using it as well. It's a 100% upstream component similar to Quay. It's pretty powerful and we will just introduce a new version of Claire with Quay 3.3, which then introduces the support for programming languages initially limited to Python. So you need to ask yourself the question whether you want to use it. We recommend it because we believe scanning at the registry level is the best place where it makes most sense and where it scales best. Yeah, so this is our recommendation. This does not automatically mean that you should not use any additional scanner, scanner or other security management tools. Of course, you can do this and we strongly encourage you to do so, uh, but you still can use Claire as a second um, view on the same things. Um, another thing which is optional are the Quay build triggers. So what is it? Effectively, it means that it can Quay can take care of automatically building images um, triggered by actions which happen in any of the Git uh, tools we are supporting, such as GitHub, Bitbucket, GitLab, and of course also gust, uh, custom Git. So as long as the Docker file is stored in the repository, we can automatically trigger a build and then the image, the resulting image is pushed into Quay. And we just introduced a, a very powerful feature for a better customization of the tagging. So this is a feature you just need to decide whether you want to use it uh, or not. You can make the decision or change the decision at any point of time. I just want to call it out because this might have an impact in some environment what the underlying infrastructure should look like. On the deployment patterns, so the second part of this presentation, there are a couple of options or choices you have there. So for example, we already briefly touched the question whether should I run it on a standalone host versus Kubernetes? What are my target destination? How many? Where are they? What's the technology used there? Should I use Jira application or is it more repository mirroring what I want to use? What about sizing guidance? What about subscriptions I need? Uh, and what about HA? So how do I achieve HA? Let's go through those different points. Um, let me start with the deployment example. As I mentioned it, Quay runs perfectly fine on a developer. It runs in a data center. It runs also uh, stretched across multiple data centers. So this is not an issue. It runs on, on effectively any infrastructure as long as it's a container runtime. The important point here is again, Quay and Claire and the repository mirroring, all of them are stateless container, containers. Yeah, so the critical components of a Quay deployment are still the database and the storage backend. And how you achieve the HA, this is entirely up to you and probably you won't change it just for container workloads. Probably you will continue to use all the services you have used in the past to ensure HA for those mission critical services, which are probably not only used by Quay typically. The question to which environments or destination targets Quay is serving content to is fairly easy to answer. 
Quake can serve con content to any OCI compliant target. Yeah, so as long as the client speaks the standards and specifications such as the Docker registry API or OCI distribution spec, which is upcoming, uh, you are totally fine. Yeah, so it, it, we also, we still have a long-term spec support. Um, we deprecated the Docker v1 push support, but we still support Docker v1 pulls in the query registry as of today which means you can serve content to any container host, to plain vanilla Kubernetes, to OpenShift cluster, and it doesn't matter if it's one client or hundred or thousands up to millions. So this doesn't matter. It also doesn't matter whether the clients run in the same data center or in a different data center, even up to a different region. If the clients run in a different region, then you might need, need to go back to the G replication question we will answer in a few minutes. Yeah, but otherwise it doesn't matter where, how many clients, etc. This is really not an important question you need to answer. Let's quickly have a look at the question whether you want to use geo-replication or repository mirroring. Since Quay is the only registry out there which has two features, so geo-replication and repository mirroring, Many customers and other guys are mixing up a little bit what those features have been made for. Those are different and complementary features. Those are not conflicting with each other. So if you just look at the high level, let's say data flow into your environment, the recommended way uh, to source content from various external sources, such as your suppliers, the Reddit container catalog, community images from Docker Hub or somewhere else. Um, the recommended way to do this is to use a registry as the primary content ingress point, so the single source of truth. So this is how you get content into the registry and repository mirroring has been intentionally designed in a way that it allows explicitly whitelisted content, yeah? which means you need to explicitly select the external content you want to mirror into your registry, so as a starting point. Starting from this primary registry, so the entry point into your environment, you effectively have two or maybe even more options if you, if you also include the various combinations coming out of it. One option is that the primary registry is using geo-replication to ensure that if clients, for example, are running in North America and other clients are running in EMEA, there's one large single globally distributed Quay deployment. That's the content, the configuration, the users, everything is the same in both North America and, uh, and in EMEA. The only difference is that clients in EMEA are pulling the binary blobs from nearby storage in EMEA versus the clients in North America are pulling the, the binary blobs from the North America storage. That's the main purpose of the replication. So effectively, it's supposed to speed up the access to the, to the client. Yeah, so, and it's an asynchronous replication. So if the uh, replication hasn't been successfully completed, the fallback is still that the client then goes over the ocean and fetches the blob from the other side of the world. So geo-replication means you run one large registry and this is achieved by a shared database which is used on both sides. Again, it has two distinct storage backends but it is using one big database which is sh shared across both sides. So this is geo-replication. This is one of the options if you have clients on both continents. Another option would be the secondary registry. So basically you source all the content into the primary registry and then you deploy a second registry, which then uses repository mirroring again to mirror as and again, and again an explicit subset of whitelisted content into the secondary, which also means if your requirement is that you initially source whatever the entire repository or a sub or a huge list of repositories from Red Hat and the open source community into your development environment. And then you have a second environment where you clearly want to separate, okay, in EMEA where the software development, for example, doesn't happen, but only production workloads are running, I don't need 
all the content I originally sourced into my primary registry, I only need a very specific subset which is required to run in my production cluster and then a secondary registry makes sense and the combina or the, the connection between the first and the second would be done via repository mirroring. So effectively all the clients in EMEA in this example wouldn't have access probably even to the primary registry because they only can connect to the nearby secondary registry which runs in the EMEA region. So basically you have two options and the funny thing is you can even combine them. So you can even use geo-replication and repository mirroring side by side. So there are plenty of customers who are doing this because there might be globally dispersed setups where you, for example, want to run a geo-replication setup for both North America and EMEA, but then you have other clusters, for example, in APEC, and they're using a smaller subset, a smaller query deployment in the APEC region to serve content there. And for the APEC region, they're using repository mirroring, and for EMEA and North America, they are using um, well, geo-replication. There will be a more detailed recording on explaining those features in further detail, also how to configure and how to use them. That's why I don't need to dive too, too much into the details. It's also worth to, to mention, as I already called out, so that you can configure the clients easily in a way that you explicitly define to which of those registry tree um, the, the client is allowed to talk to. Yeah? And again, the client the client can be in an entirely agate or disconnected environment. So to summarize the key difference between repository mirroring, this is a slide I've used in the past. And again, I will run a dedicated recording on those two features and a couple of sample use cases to explain it a little bit better. Let's move on to the sizing recommendations. And this is really a tough question. So we are getting a lot of sizing question and it's really, really hard to answer them. So first of all, again, scalability is, is not the issue. Yeah, so this, there isn't any known limitation. We know um, how to use or when Quay reaches its scalability limits because we are running one of the biggest registries out there. And again, it's the same code base we ship as the on-prem product. It's exactly the same thing, right? Um, there aren't any typical sizing recommendation because it really depends on a multitude of factors. So the, the number of users, the number of images, the number of concurrent pulls and pushes, all those um, 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 data points have a significant impact on the performance requirements. There is not even an easy sum pool. Yeah. One thing which is important to understand and to know is since it's a containerized application, it's fairly easy to scale out Query and Claire, but this will definitely cause more load on the backend service. So typically the performance bottleneck is not the Query or Claire container and also not the repository mirroring worker. It's really the backend service. So if you would invest into something, then it's probably into the storage database and the connection to those um, services from the Query and Claire containers. Um, auto scaling and stuff it is you can manually configure today um, we will add this as a future capability uh, probably done via the Quay operator in future versions of Quay um, the minimum requirement this is something we can specify so the minimum requirement for Quay is 4 gigabyte we recommend 6 uh, and at least 2 or more virtual or physical CPUs Claire is a little bit more relaxed because Claire uh, is the scanning engine. Um, from a data standpoint, keep in mind, we are fetching all the security metadata um, from various sources. So it's not limited to Reddit content. We cover a long list of, of different operating systems and we just added Python, which means there's a lot of security metadata which is fetched and stored in the Claire database. So at a minimum, it's 200 megabyte. It will be probably even more. And the more images you have, of course, the more uh, vulnerability scan reports you have. And then of course, the database becomes quickly bigger. And even the storage, this really depends on how many images do you have? How many images are you sourcing from whatever Red Hat? How many images you are creating? How many of those images have shared layers? It also depends on the way how you build images and especially how you build your binaries uh, because this is the question behind this, uh, whether the, the layers really shared or not. So on this slide, we, tr we just try to provide some guidance on what is a 
typical sizing or sizing we have seen at several customers. Yeah, so the minimum setup, of course, it, it, it works that you can run only one Quay container, but typically mid and large size setups run three to five containers on average, and then they scale out to eight or 10 containers uh, if heavy load um, um, hits the registry. Claire, as I mentioned, requires a little bit less resources. So three to six containers are perfectly fine. And the mirroring ports, there was a dedicated slide on the mirroring sizing as well and how you can avoid it. You need to run more mirroring ports. So the, the one of the, the most important recommendation there is that you don't run all the mirroring operations at the same time. So if you mirror 10 repositories every single day, then please divide it into the um, the daily schedule that not all all 10 are running at the same time stuff it is um, the database as I said is the most critical requirement so we recommend to use at least four to eight core and between six and 30, 32 gig mem memory uh, so this is a huge range that's that's correct but but again so this is typically um, the most critical packet um, um, bottleneck and storage I already mentioned it the yeah the registry is typically growing but never shrinking again um, so between 1 and 20 terabytes everything uh, is perfectly fine there Redis is a little bit less relaxed if you by the way you only need or Redis becomes only really critical if you're using the create build automation if you're not using the build automation it only stores the tutorial and then of course it can be a very small uh, sizing typically the Redis cache is running somewhere on the database host um, just as an additional workload on top of it. And on the infrastructure side, we recommend that the infrastructure nodes or the host level has at least four to six cores and between 12 and 16 uh, gigabyte. So on the right side, you see kind of nearly the same sizing as we use at Credo. And you can see the number of pods and also the size, sizing except the, the, the storage obviously, um, it's it's not that big as you probably would imagine, which the, the main reason why we added this is to explain, no, it doesn't make sense that you run more than 15 uh, Quay containers by default, because if we don't need more on the Quay the side, then you probably don't need more Quay pods. So if you still have performance issues, then it's probably caused by something other than the number of Quay pods which are running there, just as a as a, a consideration. Um, as the product manager, of course, I'm also taking care on uh, the, the commercial aspects of the product. So one of the key questions over and over again are on subscriptions. So what are the different types of subscriptions and how they are measured and stuff like this. Um, as nearly any other product, uh, Reddit product, we sell subscriptions in either standard or premium su uh, support. And the query subscription as of today is based on a deployment. And the deployment effectively means it's one single query registry with a shared data backend, which means the database and the, the storage backend is the same. And the easiest way to explain it, in the query config YAML file, you can see there's only a single entry for database and there's a single entry for storage, which means if you need two entries because you run, for example, two different storage backends in different data centers or regions, then it's probably two deployments. And if you run two database backends, two distinct database backend, then it's no longer the same registry. Because as I said, beside the config file and the, the certificates, everything is stored in the database, which means if you have two different database entry points, then you have two different data sets and two different registries with different user configurations, different configurations, whatever. So those are two deployments and then it requires um, two subscriptions. The exception for the data effectively is geo-replication. Geo-replication still means it's one database because as I mentioned earlier, it's a shared database which is used on both sides, but you have two distinct storage backends, yeah, which are then mirrored from, from one to each other. Um, and that's why it requires as of today, um, two different subscriptions, or if you're replicating uh, even further, you can also replicate to a third or fourth region if you want. Um, then of course it counts per replica. So if you run a geo replication setup with three regions, then you need three subscriptions. 
the number of pods you're running, again, Quay, Claire, Builder, Repository, Mirroring Worker, this doesn't matter. Yeah, so this, this has no impact, which also means it's the same price tag for a very small deployment, but also for a very huge large scale deployment, which spans across multiple data centers or regions. There are also no further subscriptions or costs associated with all the operators which run on OpenShift as the destination target, such as the container security operator or the Quay bridge operator. They run on every OpenShift cluster and they, the only reason, so they require a Quay subscription in the sense of you can only use the container security operator if you are using Quay and then Quay requires the subscription, but the container security uh, operator itself or what you're running on OpenShift does not require an additional subscription. So if you if you use one Quay deployment to serve content to 1000 OpenShift clusters, it's perfectly fine to install 1000 uh, container security operators and 1000 bridge operators on all those clusters without having any additional costs. It also doesn't matter, again, the sizing is what I already mentioned, how many, how big the sizing of the underlying infrastructure is, whether it's an, uh, a standalone host, multiple of them, if it's in one data center or multiple one, this doesn't matter. The, again, the requirement is it's one shared database and one shared storage backend. Typically, there is a load balancer in front of those to ensure that it's only one. It's it's worth to be called out here that as of today, we do not support uh, replicas for the database, neither read only nor active active setups are um, currently supported. We are working on such um, things for future versions of Quay. And again, the number of destination targets doesn't matter. It's really, it doesn't have an impact on your subscription. And one of the last points was HA, and this is probably a little bit more complicated, the entire topic. Um, as I already mentioned a couple of times, the, oper the, the containers itself, so the pods, Quay and Claire and Mirroring and the builders, those are stateless components. And effectively the same applies to the Quay operator, which manages uh, manage those different pods and ensures the deployment and stuff like this. Yeah, so all of them are stateless. Yeah, so the only stateful components uh, which belong to Quay but not are not part of the, let's say, deliverable unit of the product is storage, the database, and the Redis cache. And I already mentioned the Redis cache is stateful, but it's less critical. So it doesn't require HA. You can, of course, still run it in HA mode, but you don't have to. But storage and database are the most critical thing. And then there are a couple of other things, of course, if we are running containers or pods, then of course somebody needs to take care that those are um, kind of highly available as well, but this is automatically done by Kubernetes or OpenShift. In front of those different pods, you have to run a load balancer. Of course, this load balancer <laughs> needs to be available as well. Um, and again, in future versions of the operators, we will do a better management of all the different workloads, leveraging all the stuff which already exists, such as the health checks or the Prometheus endpoint and stuff like this. The infrastructure HA typically is achieved by the Kubernetes platform. So if a node goes down, automatically Kubernetes or OpenShift ensures that the workload is still is moving over to another node. And of course, the same applies to the entire uh, infrastructure. So data center goes down and stuff like this. So there is no difference here between all the other workloads you're running somewhere. Um, I already mentioned all of those points which are shown here. It's worth to mention that we have a dedicated guide which talks about Quay HA um, high availability setup and we will probably extend and improve this guide um, in, in the near future as well to incorporate a couple of changes and a couple of things uh, we want to get in there. Um, for storage backends, again, the recommended way to use storage, uh, especially on OpenShift, is OpenShift Container Storage. We are using the Nuba multi-cloud object gateway, but also plain OCS out of the box features a couple of great capabilities in order to, to help us to achieve the HA for the storage. So we have, by default, we have three different uh, replicas which are uh, automatically created. Um, the node failover is automatically handled. Um, we have a couple of, of, of uh, features on the OCS side, which ensure that the, the storage backend, which again is the second most critical um, backend for Quay, 
is always there and up and running and available and accessible by Quay. Um, the same applies for, for Ceph. There are a couple of options for playing Ceph uh, to achieve HA. There's also a lot of documentation and guidance out there as well. Um, on the database side, again, the most critical thing, it's important to know that the Red Hat provided database images for Postgres, MariaDB, and MySQL are not supported in production workloads. So the support limitations, which are linked here from this slide, make clear that this is not the recommended way to run a database on OpenShift in an HA fashion. And that's why the recommendation is that typically our customers already have an HA database service for Postgres somewhere, which is operated by a DBA team, which is professional and well maintained. And it's also used by many other different ap applications and business critical services the customer is running. Um, in public cloud, again, you can use the database service provided by the public cloud provider and typically the cloud provider takes care of its availability. Or you can use alternatively Red Hat partner offerings such as the Crunchy operator. Um, and again, for the components itself, so all the parts and images, this is more or less automatically done with Kubernetes and OpenShift and the auto healing um, capabilities in there. We recommend to use at least three parts for each Quay and Claire in HA setups, and then the Quay operators monitors the health of those pods via the health check and respins it uh, if, if it's needed. And multi-site setups um, should effectively run pods on both sides, which means you have two distinct Quay clusters, but since you are still using the same database, it's one Quay deployment from a subscription perspective. Coming back to the database operator, um, I briefly mentioned the Crunchy operator. So this is one of the ecosystem partners we've been working with closely. And effectively on this slide, Crunchy tries to explain why you need to run an operator for stateful applications such as a database. And there's an, the other reason why we recommend um, partner offerings here for the database operator is not only the HA capabilities, but also all the additional feature those let's say market leaders offer in this area such as database um, backup disaster recovery failover monitoring all those great features which are not included in the database um, offerings we ship and with that i'm done for this day zero session recording i hope you enjoyed it i hope you learned a lot and i hope that i answered all the questions you wanted to ask all the time many thanks for watching take care